I think we've got to drop the nomenclature. We have to speak the language of the audiences that we're going after. Very infrequently is it the word NFT. So we aren't using that. And I think that it's important to make that the case across a lot of the wallet companies even and so forth. It's not just about NFTs. It's about our industry broadly just becoming more comprehensible. Right. Welcome, crypto friends, back again for a deep dive on Mind with CoinFund. My name is Jake Brookman, founder and CEO of CoinFund. Proud to be spending an afternoon thinking about the future of blockchain with my co host and our head of venture investments, David Pakman. Hey, Jake. Good to see you again. We are grinding it out in Miami and New York and Boston and all the places where CoinFund lives because there's too much cool stuff going on. So we have a good conversation today. Absolutely. We're definitely keeping it busy. We're hiring. The office was really busy in New York last week. I was there. I can attest. Our guest today comes from an organization that's pretty special to us because it was actually one of the several and few investments that we worked on together with you, David, when you were our patron at Venrock. And we've also had a very long standing, close relationship with this team all the way from 2018 as they have grown as they've built their products, as they've navigated the NFT space and market, as they've converted a lot of incredible IP owners and so on and so forth. So I am super excited about today's show. I am too. And I think there's a little bit of a controversy here maybe as well, because NFTs are a topic that not a lot of people are talking about today, but this is the company that literally invented the NFT standard. And this is a company that has had two legitimate blockbuster product hits in its lifetime already, but many of us are counting on at least three or four for this company to be super successful. And, and you're right, Jake, this was a company that when I was at Benrock and, and we started first working together, we both invested in early. So we're investors in this company and we're investors in the blockchain they created. So let's get right to it and welcome our guest. She is a longtime investor herself. She was previously a partner at Andreessen Horowitz before she joined Dapper Labs as VP, Radima Khan. Welcome. Hello. Thanks for having me. So psyched you're here. And we do promise our listeners that we're going to get right into the contrarian thinking and into the meat of the matter quickly. But before we get into some questions, let's just make sure we're on the same page. What is the true North Star for Dapper? Like, how does maybe that differ from Flow, which you guys created? Yeah. So the North Star for Dapper is really to build products that bring people together where everyone can own and get value from their data and digital assets and where creators, developers, and the biggest brands can build incredible experiences for their communities. And on Flow, which is where all of our products are built, Flow is the layer one blockchain that's leading the charge and bringing blockchain technology to everyday consumers. So the consumerization of tech we think happens when advancements in technology become accessible and useful for everyone in their daily lives, not just tech enthusiasts. And that's really what Flow's aim is for us. And so we're really excited about all the new developers that are building on Flow and the consumer applications that are already built up there. Awesome. Well, maybe I should just start with some kind of hard questions. I guess like Redima, one thing on everybody's mind is sort of what's up with the NFT market? There's a lot of excitement in 21, 22, but now things seem to be a lot more calmer. Like What's going on? What's the outlook here? What should we expect in the future? Yeah, you know, people say that things have slowed down, and I think on a relative basis to the last couple of years, they, they have slowed down a decent amount. But at the same time, when you look at the activity that happened in NFTs prior to sort of that uptick we saw, it was much, much slower. And even in the past year, I'd say in 2024, we've seen a lot of exciting things happening. So, for example, the Victor Wemenyama moment sold for over $140,000. We've seen new audiences come into the space. So I think it's become much more mainstream. So while it maybe has seemed like it's kind mm -hmm. of was at a peak and then it's come down a little bit, I would say that peak certainly helped more mass adoption. And that's really the goal. But I'm optimistic for NFTs. And frankly, I think this is a really healthy time for our industry because it's forced a lot of companies to really buckle down and say, what is the value of this? And is this something that consumers want to participate in? It's become less speculative, and I think that's actually a really good thing for the space. And a lot of people that were trying to make a quick buck aren't really engaging in that way anymore. David, don't you feel like that happens a lot in crypto markets? Like we start 
very low. Then we have this crazy bull market and it, the bull market kind of subsides and everyone's like, oh, this is dead. But the reality is we're like 10x from where we started yeah. in the first place. Totally. There's like a recency bias of looking at numbers, right? And saying, oh, well, they were high and now they're low. But if you actually just drew a straight line from where we started to where we are, I mean, I think we're doing some, I haven't, I haven't looked in the last few weeks, but I still think we might be at six, seven, eight hundred million dollars of NFT sales per month, right? <laughs> is that a tiny market? But, but it is maybe a feature or a bug of crypto that we financialize technology so early and the speculators rush in and we kind of get these early bubbles or maybe just misplaced expectations or maybe just we're early. But, you know, Redima, you've had at least two bona fide hits on your hands. You invented NFTs and created CryptoKitties, which broke Ethereum in December of 2017, I believe. Then you created MBA Top Shop in an attempt to really reach out to more mainstream, not just the crypto degens. And that was a bona fide hit. And now as we're all pointing out, we're in the, is NFT still a thing question? So in your corner of consumer crypto, what are people just not talking about? What should we focus on? I still think that there's too many people underestimate the importance of user experience and utility in the adoption of crypto and blockchain tech. So they're building products that appeal to a very small audience. And what I think is valuable is to take that and sort of think about how we can expand it to a broader audience. I, I feel like Dapper was one of the first companies to go after consumer at the scale that they did and part of their strategy. And I remember, David, you were like really championing a strategy was to kind of hide the complex technological blockchain portions of it from users and just give them like pretty normal logins and user accounts as they would be doing in Web 2. And I feel like that strategy actually worked really well. Redima, do you think that's kind of how it's going to be, like blockchain is going to recede more and more into the background? Or do you feel like maybe people will just get more familiar with the tech, just like they did with internet or computers or something in the past? I think it'll be a combination, but primarily it'll be making it easier and hiding the technology in the background in the same way that when you're just browsing the internet, you're not necessarily thinking about the technical components of it. You're more looking for what you're looking for. And then once you find it, you're not really focused on sort of the tech behind it. And, and that's for how we're going to reach mass adoption. I think for developers and more on the technology side, there is a massive opportunity for growth, but for mass adoption beyond sort of what we're seeing as far as the 10,000 people, we really needed to expand from CryptoKitties to a broader group. And that's how we did it was by making it much easier for people to access. Um, but Jake, to your point earlier around, you know, where are we in this space? I think where we are right now is still in such a nascent place. When we think about the experience that you have, it's not perfect across most NFT products today, but the progress that we've made and were forced to make when that wave of interest came in was really critical for us to expand and increase the way that we can have users engage with this technology. So the argument you're making is that most of the people in the consumer side of crypto don't consider user experience or don't prioritize making it as seamless, easy, intuitive as Web2 and the importance of it in reaching mainstream users. But you also have taken as a company two different paths. And I'd love to hear your thinking about which is likely to be more successful in the future. One is you created original IP, Cats on the Blockchain, with CryptoKitties. And that was, you know, at a small corner of the world, which was crypto, you know, really successful among crypto people. And then you partnered with one of the biggest global brands in the world, the NBA, and released NBA Top Shot. I think there's, you know, eight or 900 million global NBA fans. And that was an IP, you know, that you had to create yourself. I mean, you had to create gameplay and the economy and the UX and all that stuff. So which path do you think is likely to produce more success in the future? It's a combination because what we found with CryptoKitties and our own IP really is that it brought a lot of developers and more tech people into the space. And that's really critical for innovation. At the same time, when we thought about, okay, what benefits could we bring to a broader audience and who are the biggest players in that space? We think about NBA, we think about Disney. Those leagues and organizations also share this similar view of this is a 10-year play. So I was chatting with Adam Silver at the last NBA All-Star and they have an infinite time horizon, right? The NBA has been around forever. So when you have that opportunity, you think about what are the deepest experiences and what's the foundation that we need to create to build those deep fan experiences. And that's where 
these larger brands come into play and can really take us to the next level and challenge us to build products that not just the early adopters will appreciate. And both paths seem to be valid because we've got pudgy penguins and we've got, you know, the early success with Yuga Labs properties, which brought a lot of DGENs excited in NFTs. And those were all sort of original creations. So you, you think both are valid strategies, but you're preferring to work with some of the largest IP in the world. Yeah. And on the flow side, we want to bring in the best developers and have them build products on the flow blockchain as well. So it's a different audience. These are two very important audiences. They're sort of the mainstream fans and then there's the tech community, right? And we want both of those groups to be highly engaged. When you think about the ballast for a lot of these products right now, it is the people that were early days who have been loyal through and through to the technology. And that's who we're seeing participate and I think keep some of the floor prices up on a number of the projects that are doing well right now. What are you guys seeing? What do you think is super exciting when you think about it from an investment standpoint? Just in general? <laughs> or like Within the, the NFT, NFT space and just kind of where we are right now. David, you want to take a crack at that one? Well, I don't love where we are, but I think what we see generally where we are is a relatively small number of highly active, almost mercenary type traders, maybe somewhere between 10 and 50,000 people who are responsible for most of the sales volume in NFT trading. Popular collections and blue chips have high floor prices and a little that. And then we have a bunch of interesting people experimenting with totally new approaches, Pudgy Penguins being probably the one that people hear about the most because it's got this real world component. But boy, there's so much. I mean, you know, Mattel and Nike and a bunch of other really interesting brands and on Solana, tons of new original brands. So we see a lot of experimentation and we're probably comparing it to what we saw in 2021. So we're looking at that and saying nothing's exploding the way it did before. But I'm a patient investor and so is Jake. And, and in fact, Jake, maybe you could also... You have this unique approach. One, you were attracted to NFTs early on as a concept because you yourself are like a digital artist <laughs> and, and you're in the art community and you're a collector. So could you maybe talk just a little bit about that and then we could throw that back to Redima? Well, I watched this whole thing sort of come together from very early days, right? So just to give a little bit of a history here, I think the first time I saw NFTs was on the counterparty blockchain. It was like Rare Pepe's being tokenized on that blockchain as very early NFTs. And I saw that and I was like, wow, that's a medium for people to basically get their art out there and be able to sell it to a, a kind of differentiated market. And in 2019, when we actually made uh, a little bit of an investment in the space, it was an early investment in an app called Additional, which was kind of like a Instagram where you could mint like your post was like a minted NFT, basically. You could do a photo or an image or something. It really felt like digital artists were leading the way for blockchain adoption. Like this was like a tangible, visible group of people who were using blockchain in kind of a non-finance way, not for trading, not for yeah, doing options and derivatives and things like that. And then they found this new market where they could sell digital art and actually you know, I funded a few sort of early NFT artists in 2019 who later became, you know, they started selling art for a few thousand bucks a, a piece. They became like Yelitsa Rodriguez is on my website, firstedition.xyz, right? As an early NFT participant who ended up making a career in digital art because she was able to use this new marketplace to get on her feet, essentially, and to focus on her art. So to me, the story of NFTs really starts with this community of artists who are always technology curious. And then at some point it just shifted into collectibles. And that's when OpenSea kind of came in and it started to be more about, is this rare? What are the traits? You know, we've seen some of the crazy valuations that came in at that time. And honestly, it's a little sad, but if we really take a step back, I think NFTs are rails for non-fungible goods. And so long-term, it has to include all of these things, art, collectibles, but then also, you know, various kinds of digital content that we see online. Like I always gave the example of fonts, rights to fonts, right? Or the revenue streams of fonts would be very interesting to tokenize as NFTs. And in fact, some people have done that, just not to amazing product market fit so far. And then it goes all the way to like 
tokenizing your house and your motorcycle and your car and your boat and you know everything else you know i think we're in like a very early inning here where we haven't realized the full potential of nft rails but what do you guys think yeah i think we're super early and when i think about i still angel invest and when i think about the companies that i'm most excited about it's really based on the founders that i think have the ability to sort of think through how is this going to be a profitable company at some point but also have the ability to pivot when they find an opportunity that presents itself that can kind of capture lightning in a bottle or the zeitgeist of that moment. But having a really long term view, I think, is critical. And that's why, you know, I've invested in companies like Cryptoys and Alchemy and a mm-hmm. few others, but also made a big bet on Dapper, joined Roham because I think Roham has a great ability to sort of think long term and have a vision on what's going to be successful and then look at sort of our business today and say, how can we? capture what fans are really excited about and build our products and be nimble enough to shift our products to accommodate those preferences and what fans are excited about. I also, you know, what else I think about a lot, guys, is, you know, some of the early marketplaces and NFTs, they've taken this position that, you know, all kinds of NFTs will just be like in one place, one website. But an interesting business that seems to be growing at Rarible a little bit is actually like white labeled custom marketplaces for particular brands. And we've seen like Yuga Labs and other brands really have a preference of, you know, like they kind of want to control what their NFT experience looks like for their customers. And I know that digital artists certainly do. They don't want to be like on an Amazon with everybody else. So I I often kind of struggle, like are NFTs going to be on this giant, like Amazon like thing, which is OpenSea, or is it going to be all kinds of different customized marketplaces with different user experiences and different focuses and different branding. And then that's how people will use NFTs for the most part. We've taken the approach of making our products more de- like digital destinations. So all of the uh, Top Shot NFTs, for example, we like to have one place that fans can go and that's why we've verticalized a mm-hmm. little bit more, but we still believe that users should have the right to take those NFTs wherever they want. And now with the Crescendo update that we have upcoming on Flow, where Flow will become EVM compatible, that's giving us even more of an opportunity to enable users to take their their NFTs where they want. Starting off having one destination where fans can go and know that's sort of the place where they can engage with other community members as well as their digital assets, I think is really valuable as a starting place. I think the answer is yes to both. I mean, that's one of the things about crypto is when something's on chain, anyone can find it and look at it and index it. And so you can always have an open sea that indexes every NFT. Doesn't mean that's a place where the primary drops will happen and it, and it probably won't have a really nice bridge to the other things you can do with your NFT, right? I think that's what we kind of didn't see enough of in NFT 1.0 is what do you do with this thing other than, you know, own it or trade it. But Dapper's view, Redeem, as I understand it, is like these things are useful beyond just collecting or the trading, like you can use them in games and So maybe you could talk a little bit about that, like how you're activating NFTs in these different game products. Yeah, so we think about the first layer of sort of collecting and trading as being part of it. But when we think about our products upcoming, like Disney Pinnacle, as well as our existing products, we're constantly thinking of what else people can do with these NFTs and how owning them can result in a community that you can be part of. So for example, with MBA, we have the Nine Lives Lounge. And that's some of our biggest, most loyal fans and users. For them, because they're part of this community, they get benefits like coming to games with us or different community events, whether it's NBA Summer League or elsewhere, we're really aligning their membership um, and their usage with things that they are excited about in the real world as well. You've mentioned Disney a couple of times, and maybe we can explore that a little bit more. You guys are sort of the master of finding interesting giant, I don't even know if it's fair to call the web too, but you know, just giant IP owners who are comfortable with licensing partnerships and trying to bring those to web three. Can you talk a little bit about the Disney effort and how that's going and what you think is left to be done there? Yeah. So with Disney, this initially started actually a few years ago when I was at Andreessen and Disney came in and they were hoping to find new ways to engage their fans and new usage for their IP. I immediately thought of Dapper because Dapper has the ability to think through a fan base and does exactly that. And it it was a newer, a younger audience that Disney was trying to engage. And so 
the initial conversation started at that time. And we're thrilled to be in a closed release right now with the product. I think a lot of products have gone to market without first finding product market fit. So what we've done is really focus on a small cohort of really engaged fans. We have a massive wait list of Disney fans that are looking to get into the product, which we're excited to let in. But we wanted to first find product market fit with this uh, very concentrated cohort. And so we'll be going to global launch later this year. And we're very excited about it. But it's really based on being able to collect and trade your favorite Disney IPs. So when we thought about different audiences we could bring into the technology or, or leverage the technology for, we thought about what's the most global and diverse fan base in the world. And of course, that's Disney fans. And so we decided that was going to be the next uh, partner we wanted to go after and create something with. And they've been great to work with. We talked a little bit about this concept of, you know, being able to use NFTs, not just in you know, a single context in a game, but being able to like take it out of the game and use it somewhere else. Or you mentioned Redima, that sounds like Dapper or Flow NFTs might be EVM compatible, which sounds like you might be able to move them onto Ethereum or, or Null2 or something in the future. Is that true? Yes. Okay, nice. And I remember I had the pleasure to interview Fred Wilson, I think it was 2017, uh, on the topic of NFTs. And the one thing that he honed in on, he said, I think the, the killer use case of NFTs is being able to take it out of the game, take some game asset out and use it in different contexts. But here's my question to you. Do we actually see that as a consumer behavior? Like it feels like that's really new and people have to change their thinking a little bit in order to do that. I honestly don't think we've seen a great use case of that just yet. And I think that takes time. So fair enough that it's going to take a little bit longer for us to get to that point. But I think about composability a lot and just the ways that we can incorporate that in. So I think about large organizations where there may be some fan bases that overlap and how you can maybe do something in one product that would benefit fans in another part of their life. When you look at our partnerships with Live Nation Ticketmaster, for example, there's some of that sort of overlap. That's something I'm really excited for, but I don't think has been nailed in our industry just yet. Well, let's talk about one positive attribute of NFTs. When they first came out, what we saw, and still to this day, extremely high spend per user who engages with NFTs. You know, the old kind of consumer web two model is 98% of the people don't pay anything for a service and a small percentage of people pay lots. But with NFTs, that's really not what we saw. The average NFT sale price in 2023, which is not a huge year for NFT sales, was $95.27. And in 2024, already halfway through the year, it's 146 bucks. So, you know, about a 50% increase. The people who buy NFTs or even interact with NFTs spend, and that's really high per user spend. There are very few goods in the world in consumer land where someone spends 100 bucks or more. And so there's this incredible promise if we can either, you know, scale that and get a lot more people to do it. You know, is this something that attracts brands, game developers, and other consumer service creators to the space redeem? Is it important? I think it depends on which partner or, or brand you're looking at. For some brands, they're hoping to attract a younger demographic or a more digitally native demographic, and this gives them an end to do that. For other brands that saw this more as sort of a one-off opportunity to make a lot of money, a lot of them have actually kind of faded into the background and they're not as interested now. But brands that have really focused on entering the space because they have a long-term view where this technology can benefit them in deepening and broadening their fan base are the ones that are really sticking it out. And I'd say the value of fans who are willing to spend that amount over a period of time is certainly attractive because it just means that audience is really engaged and sticky, which is definitely appealing to many brands. What are you excited about? I would say the space is so nascent still. So I'm excited about the pressure that's being put on companies right now to think more long term and think about adding value and utility for the users of their products. I think we're just at the foundation, you know, foundational beginnings of where we can go. And we have the best partners in the space to do that. They're all very long term thinking. When you look at, for example, Disney and all the different business units that exist, I think there's a great opportunity for us to grow the product across different 
uh, business units. And then basically bringing this technology mainstream through Crescendo as well and making it both EVM compatible, but also continuing to have the biggest brands like Mattel and Live Nation build their products on our chain is really compelling. So I would say I'm excited broadly for the space. I think there's a lot of people who are still um, skeptical of it. And so there's yeah. now an opportunity for us to show and create that sort of killer use case that's going to get more um, engagement. And that pressure, I think, is a really healthy thing. And I think from a regulatory standpoint, too, there is an opportunity for forward thinking regulators to help move the space forward. AI actually also is a really good thing for blockchain because I think it needs blockchain to validate, you know, some of the content that we're seeing and knowing that it's real and having all that on chain, I think could be really valuable. So the expansion and, and growth of interest in AI has been a good thing. It's also been a distraction for a lot of people in, in a good way where there was a lot of scrutiny, I think, around our space. And now there's a lot of scrutiny around AI. So it's kind of brought some distractions that are good, but enabling us to focus on building and just being heads down. A lot of the founders I've talked to have found this time to be really valuable versus the sort of high growth period, because now we can all focus on really just building the best products. We talked a little bit about like B2B versus B2C or like retail versus enterprise adoption. I feel like a few years ago, there were a lot of big companies who heard about the NF. This was like in 2021, right? When we had that big inflection point, I like to say like in February, NFTs went on Saturday Night Live, and then it became kind of a thing. Around that time, I remember talking to some really big enterprises who had the consumer goods division, and they're like really interested in like, hey, like what can we do with this stuff? Can we digitize all our goods and have a 100% profit margin and things like that? They ended up taking a person in their division, and that person worked for a year, tried to find some use cases. At the end of that year, they kind of concluded like, there's not that much that makes sense for us here, at least yet. So I'm wondering, like, when you guys talk to enterprises now in 2024, it's after the mania of what we went through back then, what are they doing? Are they doing R&D? Are they launching products? Are they still very skeptical? Like, what's the sales cycle of NFTs in these places right now? It starts with really how is this going to add value into your user's life on a daily basis or at least really frequently? And if you can't reach a solution or an answer to that question, then it doesn't make sense to create a product. Some products don't need blockchain, right? And some that do are the ones that we want to focus on. Companies and brands are really thinking more critically about it because they don't view it as a cash grab anymore. And they're thinking about what are our company's broader goals and how can this technology help us with those broader goals? And if it can't at the moment, then it's not something that we're necessarily going to uh, engage with. But for most companies, I think identity is a really interesting use case. There's a number of paths that are worth exploring, but take deep R&D to your point to ensure that they're not a distraction for that business. Because if it's a distraction, then it oftentimes is one of these sort of innovation and initiatives that gets lost when you really have to buckle down and focus on the core tenets of your business. Let me follow up with, since you're talking to the world's biggest brands who have great consumer audiences. I'm of sort of two minds to this question, but we're, we're either terrible at naming things in crypto, all right? We pick the absolute worst. Like you can't even spell half the things, the names that we invent and these really like what, you know, how many people know what the word fungible really means? We compound that by some of the scammy, weird behavior that happens in crypto. And you put all that together into the soup of consumer experience. And you could look at this as an uninformed person and be like, I don't want anything to do with any of this. But you're talking to all these brands who seem to appreciate um, some of the positive attributes. Do we need to change the name of NFTs? I mean, you, to Jake's point earlier, when you guys launched Top Shot, you didn't mention the word crypto, you didn't mention the word blockchain, you didn't mention the word wallet. Like it was just, you know, username, password, or email address, password. I don't know. What do you think of like the sort of nomenclature of crypto broadly or NFTs in particular? I think we've got to drop the nomenclature. It is meaningful to a very small group of dedicated enthusiasts who will stay in this industry through the highs and lows. And those people are the ones that really appreciate the nomenclature, but they also get that in order for this to become greater and sort of part of daily life, we have to drop the nomenclature. So we have to speak the language of the audiences that we're going after. And so you'll notice to your point in many of our products or in all of our products, we don't call them NFTs. We call them moments in NBA Top mm. Shot and Disney Pinnacle. We call them pins. 
And so we always think about that audience and what resonates with them and what's going to get them excited. Very infrequently is it the word NFT. So we aren't using that. And I think that it's important to make that the case across a lot of the wallet companies even and so forth. It's not just about NFTs. It's about our industry broadly just becoming more comprehensible. On the retail side, do you guys have a sense of like the demographics of people who are engaging with moments and things like that? I would say right now, broadly in our space, there could be a lot more diversity. I'd say we have a fairly diverse in terms of age groups and so forth. And now that we have been focusing on different segments, we have a fairly diverse uh, user base as well. But more broadly in the industry, it's still fairly male driven. And I'd say across a range of ages, but still fairly male driven. And so that was one of the goals with with our products is to make sure that we have a diverse audience base because I think that's the only way the tech moves forward. And so when you look at, you know, Disney fans, for example, there's and the fans in that product, there's actually a high concentration of women, which is exciting to us. And so we do take a very data driven approach. I'm excited for us to continue to make our industry more diverse. Oh, but you're saying like there's not so much of a skew toward like younger people. Is that correct? I would say there is in the sense that the adoption rate for a younger demographic is much quicker. But you're a fan, right? You know, you're a fan of that sport or that IP, no matter how old you are. So it kind of depends on each IP and the fan base of those IPs. And that's kind of reflected in our products as well. Well, maybe I could go in another direction here. You might know I'm a blockchain technologist of sorts. We talked a couple of times now about the interoperability that the flow blockchain is going to have with other chains. I feel like that hasn't been at the top of the agenda for flow for a number of years. That's becoming more in focus now. And it's coming on a general trend where a lot of blockchains are being sort of put together and interoperated right now. We're seeing a lot of interoperability technology like among EVM layer twos and stuff, but also between EVM and Solana. And like, there's this whole concept of like account abstraction or chain abstraction, which the idea is that you sort of shouldn't have to worry as a user what backend blockchain you're on. Like you don't worry about whether your Tesla computer runs on Google Cloud or Amazon or something like that. Why should you have to worry about the blockchain rails? But it seems like you guys are becoming more interoperable as well in that trend. Uh, I was wondering, maybe you could say a few words about that and what's driving your thinking there and what kind of interoperability are we going to see? Yeah, I think it's always been on the roadmap. It's always been something that we've been really excited about and now amazing to see it come to life. And I think a lot of our organization right now is really energized by Crescendo, which is the update that's going to be going live on Testnet. August 14th. So we're thrilled about it. And I think that's always the direction that things have gone. But really, we started Flow right after CryptoKitties. We were looking at different chains, actually, for NBA Top Shot. And we weren't intending at that time to build our own chain, but we didn't find any that really supported the use cases that we had and the bar that we wanted to create as far as user experience, which is why we started Flow. And then we realized that there were a lot of developers and brands who were looking to build on it. So we really optimized for supporting those developers and brands. And now as the industry is shifting and growing, I think we're just along for that ride. And we wanted to create an opportunity for our ecosystem to bridge in with other ecosystems. And that's what it's going to be long term. I think it's not going to matter which chain you're on and certainly not when the industry grows to be more mainstream. But for now, we're really excited about the Crescendo update and it's been a long time in the making. So forward to it. So Redima Flow's made some interesting progress. Jake alluded to a few things you did as well with the Crescendo upgrade that's coming in EVM compatibility. But one thing that Flow has lacked has been a very rich DeFi ecosystem. Uh, DEXs, borrow lend protocols, so all the things that people love to do with making DeFi primitives composable on Flow and interoperable with other chains and being a part of the bridge ecosystem. What's going on with Flow and DeFi? Yeah, so Flow's always been about supporting mainstream apps with scalability, low fees, gameplay, and utility that it provides. But now with the rollout of Crescendo, developers don't have to choose between Flow and Ethereum. So they can bring everything they had on Ethereum and make it all available in the ecosystem, which we think creates massive benefits. And developers can enjoy the scalability, low fees, and gameplay, knowing that they're on the blockchain that a lot of the biggest brands are choosing uh, to be on. 
And then as far as DeFi, Crescendo is going to open up additional opportunities for consumers. Up until this point, DeFi has been inaccessible to consumers, but now it is. And DeFi on flow will look completely different um, from the safety and accessibility that it provides. So we think this is really a watershed moment for Web3, really an opportunity of what we've all been waiting for and fully realize the power of Web3 and what it can deliver. Jake and I are investors for Demon. I know you have been and you are on the side as well. So if you don't mind, could you guarantee one milestone for consumer crypto or blockchain that's definitely going to happen this year, just so we can make <laughs> educated investments about it? Like, what do you have high confidence in that's likely to happen this year? I think there's going to be at least one example or use case of real utility and a product that is built for fans that they're excited about because of the product and not necessarily because it's on chain. And I think once people see that use case and they understand the application, that will really get a whole nother wave of people interested in the space. And so do, do you think that use case is going to be kind of like retail facing? I think it, it'll be that's important for us to get. Because even when you look at some of the projects that have done really well, the most amount of people that they've gotten are still sort of than 10 to 20,000 range. And that's kind of where PFPs have landed. But in order to go past that and thinking through the TAM of a lot of, you know, th these bigger fan bases, it's really important that we are creating products that have true value and meaning for a broader audience of people and not just sort of like the 10 to 20,000 um, tech enthusiasts that are early adopters. Gotcha. Probably should have asked you this in the beginning of the show, but what were you sort of focusing on as an investor at Andreessen? I focused on actually the go-to-market strategies and growing products and companies. And so thinking through on the consumer side, whether it was media, entertainment, sports, basically a lot of consumer companies, as well as crypto companies like Dapper, how we could get companies to the next level. And then before that, I was an investor for the Hewlett Foundation, and we were investors across venture, private equity. I was focused primarily on corporate and structured credit, as well as fixed income. So really a broad array of investment experience across the board, but now squarely focused, I'd say, on growing Dapper and making our business most successful across these areas. I think that there's a big opportunity here. What made you sort of interested in that jump from investor to, I guess, operator? You know, I actually wanted to start a company in the real estate blockchain space. And as I was assessing that opportunity, I thought it was just too early. And so what needed to happen in order for that company to be successful was for us to reach mass adoption and, and sort of Dapper's goal of getting hundreds of millions of people and billions of people on the blockchain was going to be the thing that was the, the stepping stone that we needed in order for some of the other use cases I'm really excited about in our industry. And so I wanted to take what I'd seen as far as companies that had been successful and, and companies that hadn't been successful and, and learning from those lessons and bring those to Dapper so that we could turbocharge the team's mission and vision around making blockchain technology mainstream. I wanted to get my hands Good. dirty. Well, since you've got this nice investing background and credit background, you know, one thing that's been true about almost everything in crypto is that things, as I said earlier, like they financialize super early. And if you can financialize something in crypto, it happens. Yeah. Every asset gets the ability to borrow or lend against or um, put together into some other financial bundle or financial product because everything's composable in, in the world of crypto. How important do you think that is in NFTs? We've discussed and made investments at CoinFund about this concept that if NFTs work and are mainstream, then people will be financializing them. They'll be borrowing against them. They'll be lending them out. They'll be using them as purchasing power, making new structured products around it. Um, but how important is that in other parts of crypto? It's essential. You can't have DeFi unless you have sort yeah. of all those components, DEXs, et cetera. But what about NFTs? Do we need that for NFTs to be successful? And if so, like early in their life or later? I think we actually need some more regulation around the space in order to truly do that with NFTs, frankly. But I think there's an opportunity, I'd say maybe a little bit later. I think right now we just need to get as many people engaged as possible. But that would certainly introduce a new demographic into the space that could be really valuable. And we're starting to see that right in the DeFi space, which is really exciting. But I don't think NFTs necessarily need that, but a certain user base would really value that. I want your answer to that too. What was the question? Do NFTs have to financialize? Do NFTs have to financialize to be successful? 
I feel like the financialization is a core feature. So I do feel like to really to really realize the value of these things to have like very liquid markets to have this new market where artists can go and just convert art into money and back i do think there needs to be a healthy financialized layer that's facilitating that that is true in art world right like there's a bunch of entities that essentially provide liquidity for art now the problem is that there's very few of them and the capital is very concentrated in the top like 0.1% of them. It's very hard to actually get that liquidity for any individual artist. But yes, I think that is a core primitive and especially like when we kind of expand the NFT rails to other areas as well, I do think that's going to be important too. That's my take. Redima, where can our listeners keep up with you or all the exciting news coming out of Dapper? Yes, you can follow us on Twitter at Dapper Labs and at flow underscore blockchain. And my handle is Redima with the eyes as one. So R1DH1MA. Amazing. Redima, thank you so much for your time. It was great to have you join us. Our podcast is barely a few weeks old and we're stoking crypto conversation all over the world. Keep the conversation going. Give us some feedback. Are we boring? Should we like stop doing this and go back to crypto trading? Or perhaps <laughs> you want to see a guest of some kind on the show. Leave us a review. Let us know what you thought. Follow me on Twitter. My handle is at jbrook, J-B-R-U-K-H. And David's handle is at pacman, P-A-K-M-A-N. Make sure you subscribe where you get your podcasts. And we'll be back soon to dig on ideas that are worth fighting for. Thank you. Thank you.